אתם עכשיו מאזינים ל-The Mind Body Podcast, בו מומחי הכושר ומאמני החיים משתפים אותנו בסודותיהם כיצד לקחת את הגוף והנפש הכי גבוה שאפשר. אלו העצות שקיוויתם לשמוע לפני הרבה שנים. תהיו מוכנים ורשמו לכם הערות, בזמן שאנחנו חושפים את האמת מאחורי הגעה לרמת כושר, ביצועים, כוח, חיתוך. ברמה הגבוהה ביותר שאפשר, טבעית, וכמובן להפוך לגרסה החזקה ביותר שלכם. ברוכים הבאים ל-The Mind Body Podcast. כאן לידור דיין, וכמו שוודאי שמתם לב, מרבית המרואיינים שלי בזמן האחרון לא דוברי עברית, אך בכל זאת החלטתי כשליח הציבור להכניס את הפודקאסטים הבאים גם בגרסה בעברית, ולתת לכם, הצופים הישראלים היקרים שלי, גם את היכולת להקשיב. אז למי שלא מבין את השפה, השארתי מספר נקודות חשובות מתחת לרעיון, כדי שתוכלו להבין על אילו נושאים אנחנו מדברים. אז היום בפודקאסט היה לי את הכבוד והזכות לדבר עם אחד האנשים המשפיעים ביותר ברשתות החברתיות בתחום הכושר. הוא שמו אליוט הולס. אליוט הוא מאמן ביצועים וכוח עולמי, כותב, סלב ברשתות החברתיות, מנטור, מאמן חיים הוליסטי והשראה למיליוני אנשים. המשימה שלו תמיד הייתה, תהפוך להיות הגרסה הטובה ביותר שלך ותהווה השראה לאחרים. עם למעלה משתיים וחצי מיליון צפיות בערוץ היוטיוב שלו, מחנה הכוח, הוא יצר לעצמו שם המייחד את פיתוח הגוף והנפש. אז לי ולאליוט הייתה שיחה די טובה על כיצד להשתמש בפחות התנגדות ודחיפה בחיים שלנו, כדי באמת לבצע את מה שאנחנו באמת רוצים, מבלי לחבל לעצמנו כל הזמן בהצלחה. משום שכולנו היינו שם. כולנו אמרנו לעצמנו שאנחנו הולכים לעשות א', ב' וג', ובסוף אפילו לא עשינו את א'. <laughs> מה שאליוט הסביר ברעיון הוא שהיכולת שלנו להיות בסדר עם זה שלא תמיד אנחנו עומדים במילה שלנו עם עצמנו, או בדברים שקורים לנו בחיים זה בסדר, ולהסתכל על כל דבר בצורה טובה יותר ורגועה יותר, מאשר ישר ל- להלחיץ את עצמנו, או להגיד לעצמנו כמה סתומים, או לא בסדר אנחנו. דווקא תגרום לנו לעשות את הדברים שהיה קשה לנו לעשות בעבר. בנוסף, אליוט דיבר על טכניקת מדיטציה בשם אושו, שמה שהיא בעצם עושה, היא מאפשרת לנו להשתמש בגוף ובקול שלנו, ולהוציא החוצה את כל המטענים והרגשות שיש לנו כדי להשתחרר מהכאב. אז בבקשה מכם, רשמו לכם נקודות חשובות מהשיחה ואל תהיו רק שומעים פסיביים, כמו שאני הייתי למשך שנים, משום שסביר להניח שלא תזכרו שום דבר משמיעה פסיבית. ודאו שאתם במצב רגשי נכון, ובאמת תקשיבו כדי ללמוד, משום שאינפורמציה ללא מצב רגשי נכון לא תעזור לכם בכלום, נקודה. אז אל תגידו, hmm, כן, לידור, אני מבין מה אתה אומר, אז... קדימה, כנסו למצב רגשי נכון, תזיזו את הגוף כמו שצריך, וקדימה, ללא כל מילים מיותרות, בואו נתחיל ברעיון. be true and that didn't include student loans and a home foreclosure and I built my business from there to uh, being subscribed to by over two million people on YouTube uh, I have a large social media presence uh, I also uh, own a publishing company I travel the world giving uh, putting on events where I teach active meditation and Uh, and I'm also getting ready to release a book called the non jobs revolution which is about how the world has changed in such a way that it is not just your right but your responsibility to earn a living these days doing what your heart is calling you to do being who you really are uh, and earning a living that way so we call these non jobs mm. and uh, that's just one more piece of <laughs> a big pie I've created over the And you said that you've been in a debt of ninety thousand dollars and all of that happened uh, while you was uh, you had kids at that time right yeah so what's yeah, going we, into uh, the mind 
or when you are like in depth and because many people and myself I can tell that we have a, a fear of uh, money because if we we get into uh, uh, we, we are in debt so we, we have this emotion like uh, our life depends on it and we are going to die so how can you actually pass through this uh, fear of uh, money well I started out with a lot of with deeply in debt as many of us do so I made it my number one priority to get out of debt I didn't get any car loans me and my wife lived very meagerly for very many years while I paid off all my debt so for a good three years there every dollar I made basically went to paying that off now I had help with uh, I hired a company called corporate turnaround <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, you know they were like our litigator they were like our lawyer our attorney that worked with the banks for us to pay it back so I did some research to see how I can actually get out of debt, and I did it. I was also lucky to be introduced to Dave Ramsey at the time, and he's got a wonderful book. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's his most popular book, um, The Total Money Makeover, I think it was called. And his whole book, the whole story, the whole book, his whole one of his keys is don't try to amass wealth. Don't try to live an extravagant life if you're in debt. Your first job is to pay off your debt, so dedicate yourself to that, so that you can be free at some point. And it, you, you know, then money can actually amass, you can build a life for yourself. But as long as you're in this hole, particularly consumer debt, you know, that's not generating revenue for you, or has the potential to, it's just lost, with high interest rate, you ain't going nowhere if you want to play Babylon, you're not going anywhere if you want to play in civilization as it is, so might as well, either that or do bankruptcy. It's hard to move if you have debt. Yeah. Do you, do you believe we all need to be in a must situation in order to actually grow as human beings? Because our brain is functioned to make us survive. And uh, if we have uh, the opportunity, the, then we always seek for the, the right option, the, the comfort zone, right? So do you think we always need to push ourselves to a must situation? There is no need to push. <laughs> That's exactly the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do is to allow what's happening to unfold. Because when in the pushing, there's resistance. In the allowing, you're going to re just realize that there's going to be pain. Be prepared for it. I'm going to be sad at times. I'm going to be devastated at times. I'm going to be scared at times. Be okay with that. Allow those feelings to process through you. But be detached enough that you say, but I'm going to do it anyway. If you knew that's where you're called. Many, most of the times, where your heart is being called is where you have the most charge, the most energy surrounding it. So if you're triggered and you don't know how to process these emotions, you're going to allow your, that primal instinct that is not brought up into the heart or into the brain to guide you. And what's your opinion about living in a beautiful state? Like uh, six months ago, I've been in a... Tony Robbins seminar and uh, it's called Date with Destiny and he said that he got himself into uh, where whenever he feel this uh, negative emotion so he, he has a rule of 90 seconds rules so when it appears like if it's uh, sadness hungry uh, then he has 90 seconds then he think about something he can, he can appreciate in his life and uh, once he gets into it then it's it's gone. Do you feel we? So do we feel we we need to uh, cut this or let this negative emotion uh, be in our life? Because you said like uh, you you got to 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 feel it. It's coming anyway. As long as you're living on Earth, it's going to come. You're going that the pain is a part of this experience. You're going to have negative emotions arise from the circumstances in life. Cause that. Somebody dies. You know, how do you avoid that? What I'm simply saying is very much like Tony Robbins, but I'm giving you a shortcut. Tony Robbins, you've got a period of time. I get it. People want periods of time and they want a prescription. What I'm telling you is that you can instantly, not 90 seconds, allow that to come. Know what it is. It's, it's merely an emotion which is a trigger that's telling me something 
about myself and my experience right now. Completely detached. You don't need 90 seconds. And you can, in that moment, begin to reframe the fear into a reason why this fear is here. That's empowering. Mm -hmm. You can change your mind. You don't have to think about babies uh, cuddling or puppy dogs to distract yourself. You can immediately turn your mind to the solution to the challenge you're being offered. Do you follow? Yes. Mine is a faster way. And I also saw a video of you about uh, being a, a brain slave. And we all are at a certain point in our life uh, slave into our brain. We all have these doubts. So how can you get out of yourself and all of this negative emotion that's coming into your head? Well, the first thing is that the negative emotion arises from the body. The head is what makes the decision about what to do about that emotion. Negative emotion, emotions don't happen here, emotions happen here. See, when something horrible happens, it feels like a punch in the gut, or you're scared, you do this. Emotion happens completely in the body. The head is the interpretive function that begins judging the emotion. Brain slave means you're trapped in this cycle of Emotion rising, judgment about it, and this is what keeps people trapped in fear. You said you wanted to start a business before. You said you wanted a girlfriend before. You said, but they're trapped in fear because emotion rises. Um, where am I going with this? What? I lost my. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's okay. Uh, repeat the question so that I can get back on track. So, so the question was, uh, when you're in... Brain slave. Yes, yeah, you're brain, brain slave. Good. So the solution to that, the solution, my solution, I listened to an audio by Abraham just now. Abraham Hicks, she, I love her stuff. It was about meditation. It's a brand new one. You might want to listen to it. She gives all the, the beautiful benefit of meditation and how meditation feels in the body, and she does a beautiful job. One piece, which is a strategy, I get it, but strategies are important. That's why... Uh, it's only gives you 90 seconds. One strategy to get the head out of the way so that the emotions can pass through unobstructed by judgment is with active meditation and bioenergetics. And this is what I bring to the table through grounding camp. When you when the when you shake your head literally, you can't think. You can't think in linear thoughts and patterns when you're shaking your body, when you're dancing and you're breathing. And you're, the things that we do there are all designed to support getting some freedom in your body and getting your head turned off a little bit. It's meditation. And uh, there's just different strategy. And about meditation, I saw you talking a lot about Osho dynamic meditation. Can you please share us uh, what is it and how did this uh, change uh, made the change in your life? Okay, well, that's what this is about. Uh, I first discovered Osho Dynamic Meditation when I was about 24 years old. A very challenging time in my life, as I've discovered is for many 24-year-olds. When we're going out into the world, we're literally, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a launching point for many of us. And it's the end of a 12-year cycle, so we're literally starting new in our lives at that age. Uh, I was with my girlfriend that I... Uh, from high school and we got married and we got pregnant. We were living in my father-in-law's basement and I had just lost my job and it was a cold, cold winter and I was depressed and I got sick. And I had also been reading the books of a man named Osho. Osho is an Indian mystic. One of the beautiful things that he brought to the table, not just his philosophy, were his meditation techniques. They're called active meditations. And when I was reading about it, I realized that this is something, what I felt in my body with regards to the depression and the sickness, reading the process associated with active meditations, to me, said, yes, this is what will heal me, this is what will support me, this is what will help me in my journey at this point. I need meditation, but this kind of meditation appeals to me because I'm an athlete, I'm a very physical person, and the meditation is as such. You, because it's designed to charge the body with, with one stage through deep, chaotic, fast breathing through the nose, uh, that right there is going sideways for most people. That, in and of itself, will throw you sideways if you allow yourself to really engage in just breathing. When I say sideways, I mean into a more meditative state, a more 
his line of state. Then there's catharsis, which is the second stage, where all the repressed emotion that you have been holding back with your muscle, you know, all the tension in your jaw, across your chest, and in your pelvic floor, you have an opportunity now to express whatever emotion arises so that that can be released from your body. So for 10 minutes, in 10 minutes, you're cathartic, meaning yell, scream, cry, laugh, dance, shake, be silly, ooh, whatever it is, that's your moment to do that. How often do people get, nobody gets silly. Because mm -hmm. you're breaking your face up, mask up. <laughs> that's why we keep Skelly Hell doing things like this. Like, this guy's nuts. Hey, I'm putting my mask away for a moment. It would be freeing for many people to do that. That's the appeal. Break all your masks, break all your armor, let it go. You're safe, you're free, and you're always an observer. You're always a watcher. You're not going to go crazy because you're still conscious. That's where the separation happens between the tornado of the body and its emotions and your watcher, your spiritual self. There's a, that pulling those two apart in that moment is a meditation. It's a, it's a realignment. The third stage is grounding. You know, that's exciting. We gotta come back down to earth, which ultimately leads to a stillness and a silence. Stillness. Uh, the true meditation. Everything else is to get the anxiety out of our bodies and to prepare us for the stillness that's available once we release what we've been carrying. And uh, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. So I was drawn to that, and I did a workshop in New York City for 21 days back in uh, 2003, uh, and I enjoyed it. It was great. It really it served me. It boosted me into the next phase of my life. But what made it even more fascinating was that the instructor of the class, uh, I hired her for a one-on-one -on -one session for something that uh, ultimately was bioenergetics. And uh, I had a wonderful experience with that also, where I was able to release some trap uh, tension and emotion in my body through breathing exercises and, uh, and movement. So somebody that's just uh, starting out, so what would you suggest to him uh, to start the Osho meditation, like uh, every morning for 10, 15 minutes? Well, I gotta tell you, it'd be difficult because you gotta make a lot of noise. And I don't know too many people that living, living in civilization can mm -hmm. shout and jump and do these things in their home at 6 a.m. without having a police call. In fact, one of our women who went to our last grounding camp, she went back home. She lives in Stockholm. Yeah. And uh, two police officers came. She was doing our meditation, <laughs> the Osho meditation, at home. And so that's why I created Grounding Camp, so that you can come together with other people and experience this yourself. And we do it for three days right now. We're opening up to seven days and 21 days that we are ultimately going to be doing. But... Um, I feel called to, to create a space for that. That's what Grounding Camp is all about. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I also also want to ask you, who was your biggest uh, maybe mentor or idol in life? Uh, you were breaking up there for a minute, but if, if you're asking me my greatest mentors, uh, I have to put an S on it, you know. Um, you said I think you said mentor, but I'm saying mentors because there have been a long line of men in my life that have played very important mentor, father figure, educator roles for me. And you know, it, you know, it goes as far back as my uncle teaching me uh, how to work out when I was a Four years old, he had me doing push-ups using martial arts and stuff, uh, to high school football coaches, to my uncle again at a particular time, and uh, coaches and uh, teachers. And so, you know, it really depends on, I think the answer is most relevant to an audience when I know exactly where, what, where they're at. You do want to talk about business mentors, you want to talk about spiritual mentors, you want to talk about... Uh, exercise mentors, you know? Yeah, so so we all have like so, mentors in our life, right? Because our parents uh, are our mentors at some point in the life. So it all yeah. depends on uh, where it goes, the business or any other area. Yeah, parents, first mentors. 
whatever your relationship is with your parents, and I say that as an assumption, I just assume. I didn't mention my uncle, my mom's brother that lived with us, but everyone that's in your home, all the adults that are in your home, my aunt lived with me. She was uh, quite a bit older. She lived to 98 years old, but I had an old woman living in my home. That's, uh, that's training too, that's mentorship too. What I also uh, love to see about you is uh, the relationship that you have with your wife. And I wanted to ask you, how can you manage it and make it so passionate and loving without getting into that hook of uh, when you're around something long enough, you take it just a little bit for granted. Because most people in relationship, when they're uh, around uh, each other long enough, they just take the relationship for granted. And I see you are really passionate and loving. So, what do you do differently? Well, there's always going to be a, an element of taking for granted because uh, you know there's an exchange there, the energy. And, uh, but I think if we remain open to the idea that we're equal partners in this. Uh, that's important, but what I I think is probably most important, I know is most important, is the sexual relationship mm -hmm. between you and your woman, myself and my woman. No matter what else we take for granted at various times, and even that can be taken take granted for times, uh, we like each other, we like to touch each other, we like to hug each other, we like to kiss each other, we snuggle in bed at night, we shower together, <laughs> we like, we're very sexual with each other. We're very close to each other that way. And uh, it's weird to me, couples that aren't, they're like, yeah, like, yeah, they may have sex, but they sleep in different beds. People live in a different bedroom. One's a snore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what keeps us close at, at, a, at a primal level is uh, our sexual polarity and our strength of attraction. And if you have maybe uh an argument or something. How can you handle this uh, argument if you get into a fight or something? Well, you can have to ask her about that because she's usually more upset with me than, <laughs> than I'm upset with her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she forgives me. I guess <laughs> that's what it is. Um, and it would be great to, to speak with her about that. But um, why carry anything? She, I have no intentions of going anywhere. She's my partner for life. Am I going to carry this big scissor, this big sharp object with me, this pain with me, so that I might cut the cord? Between, you know, in other words, like, it's a deep bond. You want to live with that bond in agony and fear or in pain, or do you want to live in that bond in peace? So put the sword down, put the scissor down, relax and enjoy to one another. Things come up, they need to be processed. That's why things come up. Things come up because they need to be dealt with. They need to be healed. If there's a pain between the two of you or miscommunication between the two of you, a misalignment between the two of you, that's going to show up so that it can be healed, so it can be dealt with. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you, know, you got to appreciate that for what it is. It's you getting to experience uh, <laughs> everything that a relationship is. The relationship to yourself, to that person, and to the relationship itself. Yes, you're absolutely right. And uh, if we can go uh, for a second to your daily rituals, uh, what is the three things you do every single day, uh, no matter what, that you never, you're like, this is a must for me every day? Yeah, I hate to imagine that it would ever be that rigid. Okay. Uh, I flexible within my structure. So what that means is that I have to have my priorities right and I have to flow with the circumstances. So for example, one thing that doesn't go by very long is me not exercising. Usually it's yoga these days. If I don't do yoga or I don't do some stretching or I get, get on a treadmill and walk, that's the simplest move non-resistant way to have the ritual of exercise in your life, then you walk, you find a way, you find a, a time and a place to go walk for an hour. You see? So for me, it's the bare minimum. I've got the exercise, I've got to be moving. That's a priority. Another priority is water. You see, so you might not think water as a ritual, 
what it is because me and my wife, we just travel. I have a water machine here that gives me the type of water that's most nourishing for my body. My wife and I were just traveling. We spent a lot of time up in New York last week. I, my ritual had to be maintained. I went to the supermarket. I bought, bought all, bought all IPH water, and I was satisfied because it was a priority. So I don't think so, so much in terms of the activity. Sometimes I look in terms of the uh, the principle behind the activity. Health. So you hear that for me? What's number one? Belly and health. Number one ritual. Take care of my health. Mm. Exercise. Water. Yes, and uh, sleep. That's a big one. Sleep. I don't fuck around with past midnight. Very rarely does that happen. That's like, oh, I'm really breaking the boundary. I get the, when we go out, I'm all, I'm back in bed by midnight. Most days during the week, 9, 30, 10 o'clock. I, I'm in bed and I get up basically the same time every day. That's another one. It's another ritual. But that's about health. It's about the circadian rhythm. It's about the hormones. In my body, and you see, so so much more powerful than you know, of that. Yeah, I I believe uh, sleep is uh, very very important, and uh, for some, uh, how much how will you suggest it? Like six hours, eight hours? It depends on the person. My teacher Paul Check was very strict about eight hours, and I thought I was getting by with seven and like that, eight. And now that I've listened to him in that, you know, without resistance, I'm doing, I've been doing that for years now, this was a long time ago, my life is better. I can't, I don't want to function on less than eight hours. Because I have the optimal energy to be able to do the things that I want to do every day. I have the mental energy to do the work I want to do. I have the emotional energy to be there for my family. I have the physical energy to exercise in an intense way if I like. You see? So for me, that's eight hours is the best medicine to get that kind of performance. And if I could take you back uh, when you were like maybe 20, 25 years old and you were uh, different at that point of life and you more maybe more aggressively, you wanted to achieve a lot. So what uh, would you say to this, uh, this Elliot uh, when he was just 25 years old? Starting uh, everything. I won't say anything to him. I probably give him a high five, or I say, "Hey, dude, you're gonna be all right." That's it. There's nothing for me to tell him. Because look, <laughs> it's okay. You're gonna be all right. So I had a lot of fear in me at that time because you know, raising a family. I mean, debt. I own my own business. All the fuck I'm doing. But I was fueled by a lot of fear. So future Elliot showed up and was just like. Had it on the back of like, dude, you got this. 25 year old Elliot would have, would have beat himself up so much on the way. <laughs> because I see like where I am right now. I, I left my country seven months ago. I came here to America to really push myself and prove myself that I can make it big and I don't want to settle in my life. So I've made the shift and I came here. And uh, yeah, I do sabotage myself sometimes. And when I get pissed, so I'm going to the gym and I just tear my body apart uh, each time I go. Uh, sometimes I go at 1 a.m. and I just like push myself and my body. And I know at some point it's not right because when you're not calm and you're always like trying and trying, then eventually you get to a point that you, you say, is that all there is when you get to where you want to go, right? So we want, we all want to to be loved, and we all want to have this calm inside of ourselves, so that we are not trying to always achieve to the that we can feel that we are enough. Mm, yeah, <laughs> but it still bothers me. <laughs> well, you know, I like to think in terms of the path of least resistance. And a lot of times we take the path of most resistance, right? You want to build a muscle, so I'm going to lift, even if it's one in the morning, and I'm going against all my biological rhythms. This is not great for my hormones. I'm not happy to be here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, you're going to be uncomfortable. The path of least resistance might say, if I get a good night's sleep tonight, I'll be refreshed. 
I'll feel good about it. I want to go to sleep right now. And in the morning, I can make a decision on am I refreshed enough to go in there and give myself a great workout. Which sounds like more resistance. Mm -hmm. Making yourself do it or deciding how this can be done without pain, without killing myself. But if you do it like the, the path of least resistance, don't you feel that you can maybe lose your uh, drive or hunger in life? Because I have times that I can wake up a little late and then I say, fuck, what did I do? I, I woke up uh, at nine uh, and... So now what's happening is you're judging it. This is where your head gets in the way. It happened. You don't need to dwell over it. What? How can you make this a nice day now? Okay, so I missed the bus to my to work. I won't be able to catch the bus till 10 o'clock because I overslept. That gives me an extra hour and a half. Yeah, I'm going to read the paper while I drink my coffee this morning. You see? As opposed to, oh no, I missed the bus. The bus is going to kill me. And then you walk and run around the house just upset and like, what can I do? And then maybe you think, oh, I can call my friend. And it, hey, you missed the bus. It's all right. Drink your coffee. Take your time. You get there when you get there and you explain yourself. You see? That's about the least resistance. Mm hmm. Yeah. We always have a choice to reframe. Yeah, so it's about reframing and see in a different way that we usually make it uh, so difficult in our brain. And it, and then it's much more releasing. And that's the part of it, that we all want to feel like... Not feel like... Oh. Okay. Uh, what made you start YouTube? That's a really interesting question I want to ask you. I uh, started training people. I'm a personal trainer, training them in the parks. And uh, I wanted them to bring their friends. And this new YouTube thing came up, so I started recording the workouts while we were doing them in the park. And then uploading them to YouTube so that they could show their friends. Hey, look what I what I've been doing. Look at this cool uh, prepared tire, or you know this car I'm pushing. And that way, their friends would want to come. So it was a marketing strategy for me, right from the beginning, to get more clients for my strength camp. But in in these days, like seven, eight years later, we live in a world that uh, everybody is trying to get your attention, and uh, they try to to sell you. And so, how can people? Uh, really brand themselves and uh, not be like everybody else because th this is a world that everybody competing with each other. Shit. You just gotta be good. But not you good enough. Great. You need to be you great. Be you. Hmm? You, you, you don't need to be just good. You need to become like... <laughs> Yeah, if what you're hoping for is millions of subscribers, you got to be for millions of subscribers. So you know what that means? Get real good. So I made YouTube videos for many, many years. I started in 2007. A lot of my videos weren't that good. They were bad. Nobody's watching them. Of course, you know, it was a long time ago, too. But over time, you can literally watch my skill develop. You can literally watch, hey, this was... People have different versions of Elliot. This is new Elliot right now because, you know, I've changed again. But there's the fat, strong man Elliot with a high-pitched voice. There's Yo Elliot, which, man, I did that for so long where I have very – there are many different versions of me if you watch very closely, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't remember where I'm going, going with that once again. Um, anyway, I transform a lot. Yeah, I, I totally understand this because if I look at what, when I started, I started uh, when I was living with my parents, I just put a dashboard behind me and started to talk. And I was super, super shy and had no self-confidence. And through uh, months to months, year by year, I see like, wow, I, I'm improving. And the better, exactly. Yeah, and it's all about... Learn things by watching other people. Like, don't think I don't see a bunch of Yo Elliot one of these out there. But that's great. I learned by watching some people. Paul Check was my first professional mentor. A lot of my videos, I sound like I'm him, looking like me. Because, you know, you, when you see truth or you see what works, you know, you adopt it into your, your art. And you make it a part of what you do. So look at other people, successful people. What are they doing? Learn something from them, you see. 
don't be afraid to pay to learn from people. Yeah, I, I see like the YouTube is kind of my personal diary, uh, my life diary. Like each time I'm feeling something or emotion, I just do it. And when I'm really attached to the heart and I do something from the heart, it gets so much beautiful and it, it gets more people to, to like it. Because you're being authentic. What? Uh, another question. What was your biggest fear, and what made you follow school? My biggest fear. Well, I had lots of fear, and I think it's been said that fear of fear is uh, is, is a place to be. And yeah, I didn't want to be fearful, so I was just courageous in the face of all fear. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that if you do the thing you fear, the death of fear is certain. And I believe that with all my heart. So I, you know, I can say there's one biggest fear. I have all kinds of fears. We have layers and layers and layers of fears within all of us. Each of us, I know I had mine, but it's how I face them every single time. And realizing that this is a trigger pointing me in a direction that should be explored. So go towards the thing that you fear. The death of fear is certain. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the next thing for you? The next thing for me is I'm going to leave here after speaking to you, go back to my home where I have my new gym, and I'm going to be doing another interview with two gentlemen that came down, but we'll be doing it in my gym. And, uh, and that's cool, and that's fun. And that is a representation of New Elliot, and I'll be making new videos again soon. And so... There's a lot of newness in my life. That's just one piece of it. Yeah, that that's really good to see uh, how you shift over the years, and now uh, I believe you're in in a good place with your life. No, it's like I can see for how your posture is, how you talk, and you're like really calm and just enjoying life and try to really experience as much as possible and. Take every part of the day and really try to to see the juice and the beauty of it. So this yeah. is this is really beautiful to see because not many people can get into this point because we are all trying to like ah if I'm like interviewing you okay I need to ask this 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 is questions and I'm not in the moment like uh, Eckhart Tolle said uh, you gotta live in the moment live in the now and I can see you're truly in the now and it's beautiful to see. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, I think I'm almost done with my questions. Uh, and another one last question uh, before I uh, uh, say the, the last question. Have you ever been shy or had no self-confidence? Maybe when you were younger? Yeah, of course. And it comes and goes. You know, self-confidence is, as with all emotions, Confidence is a, is a state of mind um, also. They come and go. You, you know, the most self-confident person, there's something he ain't so self-confident in. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he may be self-confident on the football field, he ain't so self-confident with the ladies. See? So you, 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 you bet you're going to consistently battle it in various areas in your life. I think what's most important is to be conscious of where you're confidence in being shown so that you can look at it and build the courage because that's the one that comes from the body confidence is from the mind confidence is one way of being brave courage comes from your core so uh, that that thing is no longer a thing and you can move on to another layer because another thing will show up you constantly expanding what what is your fuel uh, and drive in life what made you always be hungry for more because uh, a lot of people, they set a goal or something, and when they get there, they just settle down and uh, they lose their drive and lose their hunger. Uh, well, you know, it's a matter of enjoying the creative process. So I have fun doing more things. So I couldn't settle. Like, I want to keep doing more stuff. I'm, I'm doing so many things right now, and I want to do more. I wish it was more of me. Mm -hmm. That's okay, because I'm enjoying the process. In fact, I, I don't need to get anywhere. It's fun just being 
present as it all unfolds. <laughs> yeah. The last question I always ask before I end this interview is, uh, what is the legacy you would like to leave uh, long after you won't be here? Oh, I don't want to get too specific about it because there are so many things I know I've seeds I've planted and sparks I've set off. Uh, I would just like to be remembered as a light bearer. As somebody who, in the age of, of light, when humanity is waking up, played an interesting and important part. The internet has brought our minds together and we're advancing in consciousness. It's, it's a magnificent day to live in. And I play a part in that. There are thousands of young men who think of me as their big brother mm. or dad, father figure. So, um, I mean, that is my legacy. That's what I. I'm doing it's who I am so whether it's acknowledged or not not that important I just feel confident and comfortable with what I uh, what's happening here I think the asset of life is like growing and giving when you feel that you're always growing and you have more to give then you feel so much alive than just uh, try to meet your own needs and when we grow and we contribute to others e either it is if it's just to our family friends, uh, community, the, the higher the vision, the more fulfilled you feel. So, uh, where can uh, we find you or anybody that want to find Elliot? Just Google my name, E-L-L-I-O-T-T, -T, two T's, H-Q-L-S-E. Or, you know, that's my website, ElliotHolmes.com, so if you search that, you'll find it, we'll put it in the URL, it's up to you. Okay, uh, it was great talking to you. Uh, I really wish you the best and thank you very much for the time that you gave me. Uh, it's really an honor and I'm very grateful for that and I don't take it for granted at all. So thanks a lot. אם נהנתם לשמוע את הרעיון הזה או כל רעיון אחר ב-The Mind Body Podcast, תרגישו חופשי להירשם לפודקאסט ב-Sound Cloud, iTunes ובערוץ היוטיוב שלי. בנוסף, אשמח אם תשתפו או תשאירו הודעה בתגובות שמתחת, משום שדעתכם חשובה לי מאוד, כי כמו שאני תמיד אומר, מנהיגים יוצרים מנהיגים, וכולנו כאן כדי לגדול יחד. למידע נוסף ניתן להיכנס לאתר הבית שלי בכתובת www.lidordayan.com עד אז, אל תפסיקו לחייך!